Good morning, Cherokee Hills. How you doing this morning? I can't see you, so I'm trusting it's okay. Well, it's a Mother's Day weekend, so to all our mothers, we love you, thank you. Uh, if you are a mother and you have your children here with you, out here in the foyer, we have a nice setup uh, where you can take pictures and force your family to smile and all that fun stuff. Take a ton of pictures because teenagers love it. They do. And they just want to remember this moment the rest of their lives. So a uh, couple of quick announcements real Real quick, that made sense. Uh, we, had, we do have our Wednesday night programming going on still. Uh, we've got a few more weeks before we get to summer and it, it stops for the summer programming. Uh, it starts at 6.30. We have classes for adults all the way down to the smallest of children. So come and be a part of that on Wednesday. Get your midweek fill up. It's always very important. Uh, next Sunday during service, we'll be uh, honoring our graduates. So if you are a graduate or know a graduate, make sure to be here next Sunday to be a part of that. Uh, the 23rd of May, for those of you, raise your hand if you like hymns and like singing hymns. Okay, good. Well, uh, Dustin and our wonderful Sam over here that Sunday evening at 6 o'clock will be doing a hymn night and we'll sing some of the hopefully some of your favorite hymns, and then afterwards we'll have a time of fellowship, and so that'll just be a great night to come together uh, and, and get to sing some of those great songs that we, I know I grew up on. So uh, there was one other thing that was on here, and I lost it, so watch your bulletins. Uh, Noni sends out an email every week, so look for that. If you don't get that email, let us, you know, call the church office, give us your email so we can add you to the list and so that you can be in the know. So right now I've got a couple people that should be joining me on stage. Where will they go? I got one, two. I'm missing, where's Trista and CJ? I don't see them. We might, we might need to, okay. No, there we go. And there we go. All right, I know you're wondering why. We're going to play a little game this morning, and it's called, as you can see there, Who Knows Mom Best? And so we're going to ask questions uh, of, of, these, of the kids. The mom will answer the question uh, on a nice board that Jen is handing out to them. And, uh, and we're going to have some fun seeing what, how well these kids know their mom. And we got, obviously, we start down here, we have CJ with his mom, Trista, and then we have Caitlin with her mom, Janine, and we end up here at the end with Jared and his mom, Sarah. So the first question, boys and girls, that we're going to answer is, we'll go next because I don't remember it, <laughs> and the one I was thinking was not a good one, how old is your mom? <laughs> All right, so question number one, and be ready to write the answer to this down. It is, what's your mom's most repeated sentence or phrase? What do you hear your mom say the most? All right, come on. Does everybody have an answer locked in? Oh, CJ's ready. CJ. CJ, you want to he's going to take my job here soon. Okay. So we're going to start with CJ since he's ready and we'll give him some time. CJ wrote, do your chores. And Trista says, pick up your stuff. I think that's it. So remember, you, CJ, you have one point. All right, and now we're going to go to Caitlin. And Caitlin says, no, we don't need that. <laughs> and Janine's answer was, I love, I love you. That's hard to count it wrong, but it's wrong. All right, Jared, what do we get? I love y'all. 
And what did Sarah say? I love you. I love you. All right. That's such a loving family. I'm, wow. All right, number two question is, what do you get in trouble for by your mom most often? What is it that gets you in trouble, CJ? I can think of nothing. <laughs> He's perfect. Jared says I'm too old to get in trouble anymore. Oh, he's still old enough to get smacked around. All right, we're going to start with Caitlin this time. What's the thing you get in trouble for the most? Arguing. Yeah. I can never imagine a teenager arguing. And mom says for homework. Oh, yeah. Arguing about doing the homework. Could be, yeah. Possibility. Jared says smart comments. Making smart comments, okay. Smart remarks. Look at that. <laughs> Woo. All right, what do we got over here, CJ? Getting distracted by books and playing on the screen too long. Oh. Oh. It was so close. So close. He says, I'm reading all the time, I swear. All right, question number three is going to be what is your favorite thing about your mom. What is your favorite thing about your mom? This is a tough one. No, it shouldn't be. <laughs> no pressure. All right, and this time we're going to start at this end with Jared. He says, her compassion. Wow. You're going to cry? That's, that's, I'm going to do it. What do we got? I thought he was going to say my fried chicken. Her fried chicken. Oh, yeah. All right. He's going to write in fried chicken. That's it right there. Let's go down here to CJ. What do we say? I'm going to have to tell you to read that to me. What? Her laugh. No. Love. Love, laugh, love. It's her love and playing together. I think that's a way of showing love. Awesome. All right, and right here, she loves me no matter what. <laughs> Cooking or food. Again, I think it goes hand in hand. Wonderful. All right, give our contestants a hand. I believe Jared and Sarah took that like in a sweep almost. Was it two and two? I think, I think yeah. so. Was it two and two? Yeah. Two and two? They got two right? One tiebreaker question. One tiebreaker question. Okay. I do have a tiebreaker question. And that tiebreaker question is this. It's, it's between the two of them. What is your mom's favorite color? Now you asked that. What's your mom's favorite color? I, what's your mom's? The Twinkies don't get that. No. Hers is purple. Oh. All right. Let's see who knows this. Jared, blue and blue, all right. Pressure, blue and blue. Wow, all right, I need another tiebreaker question. I have one, I just didn't put it up on the screen. So we're gonna go to the tiebreaker question in this real quick. All right, here we go, the last tiebreaker question. If your mom were an animal, what animal would she be? <laughs> Deep questions now. Hey, we're going tiebreaker here. This is for Why all the marbles. Ah, <laughs> uh, all right. I think CJ starts this one. What animal would your mom be? A giraffe. A giraffe? <laughs> and your mom's dolphin. Oh, mammal. What? Tomato potato. Tomato, potato, yeah. And what do we got, Jared? Wiener dog. Come on. Wiener dog! All right, give him a hand. And we do have some prizes for all of our contestants. So for the winners, our Bath and Body gift card for 25 and then each of the other two get $5 gift cards. Give them a hand again. 
All right, go play drums. Go ahead. All right, have, everybody stand with me real quick, and we will pray, and we will begin our worship time together. Father, we thank you so much uh, for moms, for being able to celebrate them this morning. We love them, uh, the time, the effort, the energy uh, that they, they give to us. Father, it's truly a blessing from you, and we thank you so much for putting them into our lives, Father. Uh, we love you. We come this morning uh, to lift up your name, to, to bring you praise and honor and glory. Um, so, Father, please be in this time. We love you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Hallelujah In the presence of my enemies And I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief And I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Hope will arise. 
for our moms. Thank you for all these godly women that you put in our life, in our church. And I pray that, that today you help them feel so loved and so blessed. And Father, we recognize that this isn't always a, an easy day for people. That for various reasons, Mother's Day might be really hard. You might be missing someone or really wanting to be a mom. We lift those people up to you too. I pray that they're encouraged and that they feel your love. They feel held by you. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When the earth has quaked before, moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. my soul. 
Happy Mother's Day to you guys. Uh, you guys can be seated during this time. Um, it's such an amazing time to look back and um, just all those sacrifices that our mothers have done. Um, we wouldn't be here without them for one. And uh, just such a good time to reflect on that. So um, for all you guys out there, reach out to your moms today. For online, reach out. Uh, or to that special lady, uh, grandma, or just a, someone that influenced you, a teacher maybe, or somebody. Um, just let them know that you're thinking, and you're thinking of them, and just, just wish them a good day. It's, it's a good time right now. Um, I wanted to go into, again, at this point, we have uh, offerings where you can either drop that off at the door or online. We have options there on our website. Um, but again, that's just a call of being of obedient and faithful to what God wants you to do. Um, he knows your heart. He knows all those situations. And speaking of that, I want to go into our, our um, communion time. And again, speaking of the sacrifice that, that moms have made, going in that, looking at that, and as Jesus has made those sacrifices, um, we often forget that not only was he fully God, but he was fully man. He experienced all the feelings, all the emotions that we experience. And you just don't, it's we, sometimes we, we focus on the main highlights of the stories, but all those pieces in between each of these stories and healings, we don't hear all of those details of, he, he, was, he was fully man too, he got worn out too, right? and got exhausted and just felt weak at times and would pray for replenishment and just needed rest as well. And, and we don't always focus on this, but all the details, living a sinless life, that's so much stuff happening that we don't even know on there, but, um, but he did, and he did it for us. So as we have our communion cups, um, again, that's, this is just, it's, you know, it's a representation. This is not a, a little snack intermission time or anything like that This before the message gets going. But this is a time that we reflect on what God has done, on what sending his son to live that perfect life for our mistakes and to take our sin upon himself and to die, but then three days later to raise and rise again and give us hope and set, set the record straight. So as we go on this time, I, wanna, I actually want to give you guys about 30 seconds or so um, to, to do a prayer, to thank him for what he's done and take the bread and juice, and I will pray at the end of that time. So um, I'll go ahead and instruct, well, I'll take the, the wafer and the juice together, and then I'm going to give you just a little bit of time. So at this time, go ahead and take that wafer representing his body that was broken and beaten and just beyond recognition for us. And then in that same likeness, he took the juice, took the cup, and drank it, stating this was a new covenant of his blood that he shed over us to cover our sins. I'm going to give you a minute to pray real quick. Dear God, Father, such a perfect Father that you are. You know our hearts. You know that we don't deserve this, this gift of eternal life, but you give that freely. All those that come to you, that believe, that have faith, that ask to be with you, can be with you. 
And God, only, only in your name, only in Christ alone that we can experience that, that salvation that you bring. So God, as we continue on in our worship, speak, speak to us and guide us. What, have us listen to you and your will. What do you want us to do? What do you have? And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you guys could all stand. Oh! 
fear and death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Amen. Amen. Let's get that. That was wonderful. In the power of Christ, we stand strong. He is always there for us, and that is just wonderful, wonderful. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, thank you for always being there, for always providing, for just being that light in our life, Father. We couldn't, we couldn't do this without you. We're all here for the same reason. We're all here to, to learn more of you, to seek you out. And God, I pray that we all open our hearts and that we listen. God, you are so big and so powerful. And we don't deserve that at all. We are so sinful in nature, at our, at our core, at our heart. And that's why we need you to fill us with you and your love and your righteousness. God, speak to us today. Show us what part we need to, to work on for today to grow closer to you and encounter you and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can be seated, and at this time, all the kids are dismissed to Children's Church. I have nothing left. Between the divorce, the cancer, your mom dying and being laid off, I know it feels like you're going through a lot. <laughs> Believe me, I have been there. Just remember, when God closes a door, he opens a window. And never forget, God never gives you more than you can handle. Uh, uh, uh. God never said that. That's a pretty good intro to the sermon this morning. How are you all? Kind of a unique service this morning with game show up front and all kinds of stuff like that, but I hope, hope you get a lot out of worshiping today, and Dustin uh, does such a good job. It's really important for us to engage in worship. So we're in this series called God Never Said That, and I think, I think about it in two different ways. I think, well, God never said that, and that makes sense, but I also see God saying to us, hey, I never said that. That is something I never said. But we hear it so much, and uh, we go over it and over and over with all these cliches, Christian cliches, and we automatically assume if they get said enough that it will be a situation where we will uh, we'll rejoice in what our mothers do and what we do in our life, but it's also a part of our life that we make sure and understand that just because somebody repeats something does not mean it's going to be Scripture, okay, and be 100% right with God on this. And so I hope you'll uh, appreciate maybe some of the, the uh, attractions that we do here. For instance, last week we talked about that God does not necessarily want you to be happy, but He wants you to be holy. And, uh, and that's a very important distinction. God wants us to be holy, and if that brings about happiness in our life, that's great. If it doesn't, and we have a little bit of stress points in our life, God says, I'll be able to, to do what I need to do with you and just seek, and you just need to seek to be holy in our life. So uh, that was last week. Today we do another one, and this is maybe one of my favorite favorites of this series, and that is 
don't worry, God will never give you more than you can handle. Now, you go through certain times in your life and you have some of these issues that come along in life. Maybe it's a doctor's diagnosis. Maybe it's a loss of a job. Maybe it's a family issue that people are going through and they're hitting you up for it because it's in your family and all that. And you'll have somebody, well-meaning for sure, but you'll have somebody that will come along and go, God said I, that he would never, never give you more than you can handle. And this statement itself comes on the heels of a diagnosis or a loss of a job. Sometimes it can be with the diagnosis of cancer and you're going, that is way more than I can handle. And that's for, for sure. So I want you to think about this as we kind of unpeel this, uh, peel back this uh, statement that is made to so many people in their Christian life. Don't worry, God will never give you more than you can handle. Sounds good, doesn't it? And we think, yeah, I hope I, it's always that way. But the truth is, is that God often gives us more than we can handle so, because it will enable us to depend more on Him and not on ourselves. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a sickness or you're talking about a divorce or whether you're talking about job situations that change. Maybe relationships are on the rocks right now. You can say all you want about this, but it really does not go very far. God will never give you any more than you can handle. The reality is, is that we all find ourselves in one of three camps. One camp is, is that you may be on the verge of a difficult season in your life. Second would be you're in the middle of a difficult season in your life. And thirdly, you are coming out of a difficult season in your life. What's that say to me? Well, to me, and I think to us as a whole, difficult seasons in our life are inevitable for us. There's going to be hard times. There's going to be things that break down in our life and relationships and so forth. You remember that Jesus said in chapter 16 of John, he said, I have overcome the world, okay? In this, in this day, you're going to have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And I think that's a powerful statement from Jesus, both about happiness and holiness, but then also about this idea of the difficult things that you've got going on in your life. You most likely will find yourself in one of those three camps. Either you're on the verge of it or in the middle of it or coming out of a difficult season. And most of us can find our way to that. When your life is really spiraling out of control, it's amazing how fast it seems that there is more than we can handle. And sometimes we really struggle with that. Some of you are going through some really big stresses in your life, and you're struggling with that. It could be anything. It could be financial burdens. It could be health issues or relational issues of some sort. Things can spiral out of control pretty quick. So we have somebody who comes alongside of us and says, I know you're having a hard time. I really see you're having a tough time in this season of your life. But I just want you to know, God will never give you any more than you can handle. Here's the problem with that. It's not true at all. It's not true at all. God, and he has all kinds of examples in the Old Testament that we'll look here in just a moment. There is no scripture that says God will not give you more than you can handle. You can't find it in there. But it's so churchy. And sometimes when phrases and sentences get churchy, they lose their real meaning in life. So most often people would quote 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. So if you have your Bible, I want you to look at that with me for a second. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13. I get it here. So if you think you're standing firm, the Bible says, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation, you ought to underline that word temptation, has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. So this is kind of a form of this statement that's made in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. And bottom line, what it comes down, if you're going to get into this verse and try to make it apply to your life, it needs to apply to your life in terms of temptation. Okay. Now, I don't think God, he doesn't allow, or he allows, but he doesn't put temptation in our, uh, in our lives. But what we see in this passage in 1 Corinthians 10 is he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Not so much about suffering or difficult, hard times 
But in this passage, it's about temptation that you have going on in your life. And so we see in the context here that this is really about temptation and not about suffering uh, in the Bible. No temptation is overtaking you except what is common to man. If you're dealing with a really difficult time in your life and there's a lot of temptation in your life and so forth, you need to remember that God's there for you. He's there for you. And he can provide a way out of that temptation. But the same cannot be said, at least in surf on the surface, with suffering that we have going on in our life. We have suffering going on in our life, and what God wants us to do, and you're going to hear this several times here this morning, is God wants us to depend on Him. And if we learn that, and if we develop that kind of thinking in our heart, we're going to end up being in a place where when something comes against us and it causes some sort of testing in our life, that God will be there for us no matter what. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So there's a purpose for the testing of our faith in one form or fashion than in another. We often don't want to be told God will never give you more than you can handle because we're looking for him to peel stuff off of me so I have a better sense of uh, uh, discipleship in my life. Whether it's the death of a loved one or rebellious child that breaks your heart, these things bring, us, bring about a sense of being overwhelmed or suffering. And uh, so we've got to be aware of that, for sure. Mother's Day. Mother's Day's changed for me in the last year because my, dad, my mom died just a little over a year ago. And so this is kind of bittersweet. And uh, I know she's in heaven, and that's awesome, uh, but I miss her. My dad misses her a lot, and my sister misses her, so does my brother. It's all part of the deal that goes along with this. Here's what we know about hard seasons. And this is in your notes. Hard season teaches us to depend on his presence. When you're in a hard season, you may not even be, a, you know, being a person that gets it pulled away from you, but what God wants you to understand and wants me to understand is, is that if we are careful about how we handle the issues in our life, the thing that he wants more than anything is for us to be, pre for him to be present in our life. Bottom line, when we're tempted, God provides a way out. That's what 1 Corinthians 10 says. He will not let you be tempted to the point that you're overwhelmed with that temptation in your life. There is a way out. That's what the scripture says. But our statement is not talking about testing as much as we're talking about, don't worry, God will never give you more than you can handle. And so 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and 13 does say that God will not let you go through something and endure it to a point where you're more than you can handle. And where it comes, he will engage with us to help us get through those times in our life. And I hope you've seen that at work in your life over the past few years. And as we get older, we see things that are happening and we think about sickness and about relationship breakdowns and jobs and all this stuff that's going on in our country today, COVID and everything else. And God says, I will always be with you and I will never forsake you at all. And we need that. We need to hear that. You need to hear that from this pulpit more. And it, you need to know it in your study in Scripture that God says that he's not going to bury you under something like that, but he's going to be present to help you get through it for sure. If you do a survey of biblical accounts, we run into many people who are considered heroes of the faith, but they all have something in common. They had more than they could handle. Think about Gideon. Gideon in Judges 6 and 7, God's going to call him to help lead the nation of Israel. And what is Gideon's response? I am the weakest of my clan. I don't know, I don't have what it takes to do what you want me to do. Think, wow, that's Gideon. He didn't think he was equipped. Of course, God, we know the story. God did bring about the equipping that Gideon could lead the nation of Israel. Think about Moses for a second. Um, Moses said to God, after God said, I'm, I'm going to use you to get these people out of here, uh, the Israelites out of Egypt, Moses said, I am slow of speech. I'm not a good speaker, so I am not a good leader. These people are wearing me out. And if you read that story in that, that account, you see over and over and over that Moses was so frustrated with the people, 
And I believe there's one point in the scripture where he just says, kill me and kill me now. I'm done with this. And uh, yet God didn't do that. Why? Because God isn't going to allow anything to come into his life or that he's not in control of, for sure. David, when the weight of his sin caught up with him uh, in Psalm 38, he says, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. So he's really struggling with that. And I think we struggle with some of those same things when we're far from God or things are kind of broken down between us and God and we just say, it's just too much for us to bear. Even Jesus was overwhelmed. may not have thought about it that way. When I think about Isaiah and Job and Peter and Paul, all of them had hard times in their life and God was there for them. Jesus in Mark chapter 14, verse 33, says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. To the point of death. Now, just feel the emotion in that statement that Jesus is making here. He knows what's going to happen, and he does not want to be separated from his Father. He wants to love the people that he, God's have called him to love, but it's a, str- it's a struggle for sure. And we can say that even Jesus struggled with this even to the point of death. And so there's a lot of questions there. God allows for harder times in our lives so that we can depend on him. And we need that reminder all the time. Every day almost, we need to be reminded that God will allow for harder times in our life so that we can depend on Him. That's what God wants. God doesn't want you just necessarily happy, but He wants you to be holy. And the other thing is, is that we have to understand that God will not give us more than we can bear in terms of temptation, but that does not apply to suffering or any of the difficulties of that moment. If you're taking notes, you ought to listen to this principle, which says this. Never let the presence of a storm, see, I got it right here, so never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. If you're in a storm in your life, that does not mean that God is not there and close, because he really is. We need that truth in our life all the time. Even in the stormiest of seas in our life, guess who's going to be there? God will be there. And when the winds blow and the waves crash against the house that you've had an opportunity to deal with, you can count on Jesus helping you through that for sure. But it doesn't mean that he doesn't give us something that we uh, are not going to be able to bear. Hard seasons teach us to, to be, depend on his presence, to depend on his presence. If we can get this right, then we can survive and even grow during hard seasons. Every one of us has seen those kind of seasons come along. Remember earlier I said you're either on the verge of it or in the middle of it or you're coming out of it. That's the way it is true for, for us. So hard seasons teach us to depend on his presence. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise that God says he'll never do that. The Bible says that Jesus will never leave us or forsake us. We have somebody that can walk through these hard seasons of time. And at the first hint of trouble, we might be tempted to run and hide. We want to find our safe place where we don't have to deal with the hard seasons of life. And that's why we said, never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. And it's so important for us to get that drilled deep into our souls that just because it's stormy doesn't mean that God has forsaken you. Not at all. We live in a world today where the world has a lot of trouble of its own. Jesus said that. And then Jesus said, take heart, for I will, I will lead you through this, but it won't be easy for you at all. Hard seasons teach us to depend on his presence. I'm saying it over and over and over again because it needs to be drilled deep into our soul. God does not just leave us out there and never figures that he'll have to deal anything with us again. That's very real to many of you who have struggles in your life. And again, if you have struggles and you're in the middle of it, that's understandable. If you're on the verge of going into a troubling season, that's understandable as well. And if you're coming out of it, we rejoice in that. And for all of us, we have those moments. I believe that as we mature in our faith, we begin to delight in the presence of God. That's why the psalmist says, the Lord is near to all who call on him in truth. There's a lot of truth there for that. I've known people who've gone through a cancer diagnosis and they follow up treatment and all, all this stuff that's very hard for people to go through. 
and they have found presence or they found strength in the presence of God. And so when you're wandering through a season like that, God wants to wander with you and get you through this season for sure. They find, we find strength in the presence of God. I've known some people who've gone through severe relationship breakdowns. Maybe there's been a divorce or there's a rebellious child or something else where you don't have as much interaction with them as you used to. I've known people who are going through those kinds of things. And what they will tell you is, they will say, God is present. Even if it doesn't solve the question, I know God is present. He's with us no matter what we say. Most of us know about hideaway pizzas. There's a couple of them here in the city and then a bunch in the Tulsa area. And I went through this. I know the, I know, I know the owner of that, uh, that brand uh, very well. And so um, he attended church where I had preached at in Owasso. And uh, one of the things that was really interesting was is that when I looked and added up all of the different franchises they have, they've got 21 franchises in Arkansas and in Oklahoma. That's amazing to me. What you don't know is, is that when this all kind of started many, many years ago, uh, this guy by the name of Darren, he had all of this business and he was trying to really bump up and see if he could take it on and do a lot of great things. But he had a co-partner who basically ran the business into the ground and took everything that they had. And I remember talking to Darren about that one day and talking about, you know, how did you deal with that and what kind of struggles were there for you? And he said, you know, one thing that I really did figure out was is if I allowed God to be in the middle of whatever it was in my life, that God would prosper my business. And so he has this totally uh, very God-oriented business, and now with 21 stores in Arkansas and Oklahoma, it's big. They just opened up their 21st one in Bartlesville uh, this last month or so. So sometimes life is going to throw you a, a curveball or two, isn't it? And we have those that happen. We don't know why it does always happen that way. God may allow it to happen. I think about the Apostle Paul, and he got a curveball thrown at him when in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about the thorn in the flesh. You kind of remember that story a little bit if you've read much in 2 Corinthians, and you understand that hard times are inevitable for us. It doesn't mean we run away from them necessarily. It means that we take Jesus' hand and we walk through the valley of trouble or suffering somewhere or another. The message has it has First Corinthians or Second Corinthians seven twelve seven through ten in this way. You just you got to read it up on the screen. So I would not get a big head. I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angel did his best to get me down, and what he in fact did was push me to my knees. No danger then of walking around high and mighty. At first, I didn't think of it as a gift, and I begged God to remove it. Three times I did that, and then he told me, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. I love that. I really like this next couple phrases. Once I heard that I was glad, once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began to appreciate the gift. Did you hear that? I quit focusing on the handicap but began to appreciate the gift. I love that. It, was, it, it is, as was case, Christ's strength moving in on my weaknesses. Now, I take my limitations in stride, and with good cheer, these limitations that cut me down to size, abuse, accident, opposition, bad breaks, and I just let Christ take over. And so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. I love that representation of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. At first, I didn't think that it was much of a gift, and I begged God to remove it. Three times I did that, and he told me, my grace is sufficient for you. It's all you need. God's grace is all you need. And you get his grace when you allow him to enter into some of the difficult times you have in your life. And we can't really negate that or push it off the side and not forget, not deal with it. My strength comes into its own in my weakness. When we're weak, God is what? When we're weak, God is strong. 
That's your God that's strong. That's your God that looks at you in the middle of a difficult time in your life. It's his faith and his love for us that comes through in so much of this way. One man wrote it this way, and I thought this was really good. I would rather be in the valley with Jesus than be on the mountaintop without him. Isn't that right? Can I get an amen there? Yeah, I would rather be in the valley with Jesus than to be on the mountaintop without him. I really believe that. This is a man who gets it. This is a man who knew what hardship was, but also he knew that he was going through a tough time in his life, a valley in his life, if you want to say it that way. So he does not, try, he does not travel the road of suffering alone. He's depending on God who travels with him. So I want to challenge you to think a little bit about this statement, and I've said it over and over, and I'm going to hit it a couple more times. Never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God in your life. So much truth there. God has not abandoned you if you're in a stormy time at all. He'll walk through those uh, times with you. That's the presence of God. The second thing is the power of God. And uh, when we try to live our lives out, we have to decide whether or not we're going to lean into his presence and tap into his power. And it's important that we think of it in that way because the truth is, is so, so many of us, especially when things get hard, so many of us just really believe in our own heart that this is an unnecessary road that God's got me on. And the truth is, is that God promises his presence, but he also promises his power. Remember what it said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Paul says that in his weakness, God shows up in power. And I love that. What an amazing promise God gives us. He reveals it to us. He not only shows up, but he moves on our behalf. Shows up his presence, moving on our behalf is his power. And that's the meaning of the words that Paul used in this 2 Corinthians chapter 12. My grace is sufficient for you. Paul is saying, that is why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness. Because I know that God will get me through it. And when we go to get to the end of our row, trying to solve the issues of our hardship life, God shows up. You know that that's true because you've seen him do it in your own life. Good, difficult times, on the verge of, in the middle of, or coming out of difficult times in your life, the truth is, is that Christ is there. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. God will never do that either for him. God shows up and reveals his presence in his power, in his power. And so there's a lot that can be gained by these kinds of, exp uh, these kinds of circumstances that we find ourselves in. Um, bottom line is, is that you heard this before, God uses hard and difficult seasons to teach us to be dependent on him. And he uses those things. James said in James chapter 1, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Now, I don't know what you're going through in your life right now, but I do know that we're either on the verge of, in the middle of, or on the way out of tough times in our life. I don't know why, uh, but when I see God's presence in my life and then allow him to execute his power in my life, I'm much better off than I've ever been before. We all need a Savior, don't we? But not only do we need a Savior, we need a friend, too. Somebody that we can trust. Somebody that will walk through the difficult times in the valley and walk with us through that valley rather than us just kind of sterilizing our relationships with other people and with God, as a matter of fact, and say, I'd rather be in the valley with Jesus than be on the mountaintop without him. I think that's so true. Lots of questions that come out in terms like this. And I know people love to give this cliche, don't you worry, God will never give you more than you can handle. And what I have learned in my life is, is that God allows things into my life that go far beyond what I can handle. And that the only truth that comes out of that is, is that God will be there for you and he'll walk through those tough times in your life. Did God say that he'd never give us more than we can handle? God did not say that at all. He actually said, I will ne never leave you nor forsake you. My power is perfect in your weakness. What a great truth 
to drill us down in our life about faith. So by way of application, I want you to know this simple truth. Whatever you're going through in your life, be sure of one thing. God will never give you more than we, God and us, can handle. But when it comes to it, God's leading us through the valleys of life in order to find our strength in Him. Why? Because His power is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. And His power is made perfect in our weakness. Would you stand, please? Let's bow our heads and then we'll sing a song here at the end. Father, all of us find ourselves on this continuum of difficult seasons in our life. And it really is true that everybody in this room is either on the verge of or in the middle of or on the way out of a difficult season in their life. And the one thing that's constant through all three of those stages is you're there and you will walk with us as we deal with the circumstances of our life. Help us to have faith, God, that we can be used by you even in a difficult season. Forgive us when we try to take all on ourselves. And help us to understand, God, the, the need it is for us to, to love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbors as ourselves. May we be reminded, God, in the tough times of life that you're there. And you're there because you love us and because you want the best for us, no matter what it is. Help us to find strength in those words today. In Jesus' name, amen. I searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough That you came along And put me back together and every desire is now satisfied hearing your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friends. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. God, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Yeah. You turn morning to dancing. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to 
the dancing. Come on. You give beauty for us. Yes, you do. You turn shame into glory. Hallelujah. The only one who can. You turn graves into goddess. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Good, huh? Thank you, Dustin. Thanks for leading us. I hope you have a great Mother's Day, and you can talk to your moms, or maybe your kids will talk to you, I hope, today. So um, celebrate, though, and uh, we love you and want the best for you. So I will let you go with that. See you on Wednesday night or next Sunday. I think our sermon next Sunday is, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Yeah. So we'll have some fun with that, okay? Okay, have a great week. See ya.